Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Good morning, everyone, and thanks for um, coming down here on the Day of Caring, and uh, so that we care about Peter Thiemann's talk. Um, it is a pleasure to introduce Peter, um, whom I met uh, probably 15 years ago at some conference in, in Germany. And we both come from Germany, but we yeah, met, uh, let's say, every other year uh, on, on a conference. But our paths have been very different, uh, but now they seem to lead together again. And so Peter will talk a little bit about web programming with objects and uh, new insights into exciting type systems. Thanks a lot for joining us, Peter. Okay. Yeah, thank you for the introduction, Wolfram. And um, uh, I would like to talk to you about a um, little project that we are currently having which involves web programming and which got a little bit sidetracked into a, um, an, an enterprise in uh, types, type systems. So um, um, as a motivation for uh, looking at web programming and looking at programming languages uh, specialized for dealing with that, let's have a look at the current state of the web. So if you look at, uh, at a modern website, then you'll see basically two types of content. Namely, you have some static content that is like pictures and text and downloadable, downloadable items. And then there's also dynamic content that depends on, well, whatever, daytime, who you are, um, current contents of a database, and so on. And depending on what kind of web page you're looking at, then often more than 80 or even 90% of the content is uh, actually dynamically generated, and only uh, small parts are static. Now, for example, if you look at search engines, news services, and so on, blogs, forums, then you have such a high percentage of dynamically generated stuff. And fortunately, this is great news for us as programmers, because all this stuff has to be programmed and maintained and debugged and so on. Now, so we'll, we'll be in business for some time to come, at least. Then there's the other question, what tools we are using in order to do this kind of programming task, which is uh, uh, called web programming. And I think it's rightfully called so because it has some funny characteristics uh, which are a little bit different to other applications, other areas in which you do some programming. In particular, in web programming, you usually distinguish between two kinds of web programming, namely between server-side and client-side web programming, where um, the server-side web programming is basically some program that runs on your behalf on the web server. And client-side means that you're writing a program that runs in one form or the other on your web browser, on your own machine. And then there are lots of uh, partially historic approaches to server-side programming. So there is the good old CGI. Then there are scripting languages like Perl, PHP, Python, Ruby, and so on. And then there are integrated um, well, solutions with application servers like Surflets, JSP, ASP, uh, ASP, and so on. Uh, and I won't go into details for that because that's not really the point I want to make. Also, for client-side web programming, there is a uh, well-known JavaScript. And here, I probably have to mention Visual Basic as well, which you can also use for web programming. But all of these um, approaches have a little bit uh, of a problem. Namely, they are only targeted at one, one end of the um, of the website. So they, are either, they either reside on the server or they reside on the client. And making them communicate is, uh, um, involves a non-trivial effort of the programmer to make these two sites talk together. And therefore, um, we have the, this idea of um, uh, um, creating a language that, it, that would allow you to do mixed site web programming. And apparently, this is a good idea uh, because meanwhile, uh, you can find Google Toolkit and Echo2 and other approaches that are also going in this direction. And there are, I think, very good reasons for um, following this approach. Namely, well, you can avoid this mix of different programming languages if you want to develop web applications. 
it completely avoids this so-called impedance mismatch, mismatch that you have if there are different data representations um, involved and you have to convert data from one to the other. Clearly, different languages do have different representations here. And what's also an interesting point is that you can get rid of the explicit programming with uh, networking APIs. This is actually something that, as far as I know, uh, GWT does not achieve. But maybe some of you knows a little bit more about that than I. So we thought that it would be better not to build a toolkit, but rather build a new language, but one which is influenced by kind of the major players or by major players in this server-side and client-side game. So the major player that we selected for the server-side game was Java. The major player for the client-side game was JavaScript. And then we needed another major player for the type system side. And we have chosen um, Haskell for reasons that I will elaborate um, down here in a minute. So well, why, what is uh, the Java influence? Well, um, Java is used for server-side pro programming in things like uh, servlets and, and Java server pages. And clearly, <coughs> Uh, you need some kind of um, mechanism to um, um, to interface to interesting libraries. And of course, we want to leverage the many, many libraries that exist, the many APIs that exist for Java, or actually the same argumentation could go for C Sharp or something like that as well. But we um, want to make do with Java and use the power of the Java APIs. Well, on the client side, there is um, JavaScript, which is uh, to some extent standardized, at least. Um, but um, plain JavaScript won't do, because the language has some interesting quirks with its dynamic type system and so on that I don't really want to go into right here. So we wanted to get rid of this dynamic type system. Instead, we wanted to we want to add classes and some notion of interfaces to that system so that you can actually do programming tasks in the large with this language. So why? So the JavaScript heritage kind of enables you to do client-side web programming. And then um, with JavaScript, there's also some XML integration, which is called E4X. And you also, of course, want to leverage the existing AJAX-style libraries, which are also around here. So you want to. Uh, talk to JavaScript as well. And um, so um, we don't want, for that reason here, we don't want to give up uh, uh, this JavaScript compatibility completely, but we're going to restrict the use of JavaScript with the type system, which we think leads to more robust programs and to other features like automatic input checking and so on. And this is where the um, Haskell type system comes into play. Um, the third way that you might want to, that you might want to look at this language is um, that you could regard it as a strict Haskell with object oriented features and of course a different syntax because well i won 't go into <laughs> syntactic discussions here so um, why did we go with Haskell well um, uh, in the last couple of years uh, i 've been developing a system called wash, which is a um, um, well, a, a kind of domain-specific language for server-side web programming, which is based on Haskell and has a few interesting features that make it fairly simple to write this kind of uh, web programs. So it has a built-in session model. It has stuff like typed first-class entry fields, typed callback that you can bind to, to buttons and all that. And lots of this functionality really relies on features that are fairly unique to Haskell's type system in particular type classes and um, constructor classes. So the idea was to, well, if we have a new, if we build a language, then we don't want, then we also want these wash style features in that language. And for that reason, we needed to kind of a transposition of the type classes into something that is, um, well, that looks more object oriented. Um, and in fact, there is a close correspondence between type classes and Java interfaces. Uh, and you will you will see that in in the next couple of slides. Then, of course, um, one thing that is exploited in the type class system is that um, 
um, Haskell supplies you with uh, uh, named algebraic types that you can define by yourself. Um, this is basically the reason why uh, we needed to add classes to JavaScript. Usually JavaScript has, well, it has some types, but it doesn't really have structured types, and it doesn't have nominal types at all. So in order to make type classes work well, you need, some, you need to be able to define nominal types. So that's why we are using, we are introducing classes here, and in order to get the remaining functionality of algebraic types, we'll have union types in order to um, put classes together. And actually, union types are a nice um, starting point that you can later on extend to um, full-blown regular expression types, which are a well-known medicine for typed XML processing. But at present, we are only looking at union types. All right, so um, this is basically the, um, the uh, motivation that we, that we want to go down to. And then uh, how will this language uh, be compiled? It will be compiled to, each program will be compiled to kind of two parts, namely to servlets, Java servlets for the server, server side and JavaScript programs that will run on the client side. And um, uh, ideally, the compiler should partition the code automatically. Um, admittedly, this has turned out to be a fairly hard problem. Um, we're working, actually, one of my students is working on an analysis there. Um, but it seems like you, you're getting more leverage there by uh, actually hand annotating the code with what you want. But anyway, it would just require uh, annotations, but then the compiler inserts the communication required automatically, which means you don't have to think uh, and program in terms of networking APIs or what is it called in AJAX, this XML, HTTP, blah, blah, blah thing. Question. Uh, what the, um, all right. Um, so basically, the idea is that uh, um, you have certain APIs where you know that they can only run on certain places. Yeah. For example, if you deal with um, uh, with um, windowing stuff, then you know that it must run on the client. If you deal with database stuff, you know it must run on the on the server. And then the analysis determines which other code. Uh, remains on the server, remains on the client. And depending on which knobs you turn, if you want to minimize communication or if you want to minimize the workload of the server or the client, uh, you can get various distributions. Right? I mean, in the, 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 the extreme case, or one extreme case, would be that you say, I'm running only the uh, API calls on the server. And then you would have the, the whole application on the client with kind of um, uh, RPC style calls to the server API. Or you, the, the converse thing would be to move everything but the, um, but the user interface stuff to the server. And then you would, in, in, the, in some cases, you would get the. Are you able to automatically suggest those extreme partitionings, or is even that difficult? The extreme partitions, that, those you can express very easily, it's yeah. Just, so it's really yeah. Yeah. So, optimization right. Yeah. So the the analysis that my student is looking at involves communication cost and uh, timing and and everything, and well, uh, it's still complicated even though we abstract lots of details uh, away. Right. Okay. So I'll give you a uh, short example program, which will demonstrate some of the high-level features. And then afterwards, we'll look a little bit closer at uh, things, um, at, at mechanisms that we've built into uh, the language. So on the high level, you'll see things like XML literals, which seem to become very common right now. Then you'll see uh, how we express input widgets. And the, the interesting thing here is that uh, input widget widgets look really like um, the standard HTML input widgets, but in addition, they will bind variables for you, which you'll see in a minute. Then another point here is that you can 
uh, define actions by callback functions. And the idea is that the callback functions are attached to your uh, the elements in your um, in your GUI that are like buttons and and things like that. And what we also want is here automatic and extensible type checking for each data entry field. And here is a um, a little example program that demonstrates here these features. For example, here between the uh, two hash things here, this is an XML uh, or HTML literal, whatever you want to call it, and um, uh, the hash thing is actually a special marker which um, creates a list of um, XML uh, document nodes. Well, and here you actually have two input fields and one submit button. So just the standard uh, um, uh, um, web form. And the two names that are printed in red here um, they look like ordinary name attributes here for the input field, so that's, well, these are correct, well-formed uh, HTML, but in reality, the compiler recognizes these attributes and uh, uses these two names here as binding occurrences. So this binds a variable with name MPY, and this binds another variable with name RPT. And these variables will serve as um, um, handles to the value that you enter into these input fields. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, so is the compiler specifically aware of the name attribute of a, say, input yeah. element? Is that how it works, that you have certain attributes and certain namespaces of certain elements? I mean, or, or I mean... Well, you're I'm using, well, yeah, you're using that's just the standard elements. So the idea is that um, in writing your form, you can, you can uh, take some web designer that doesn't have any idea right. of the system. You just tell them, go write me this snippet of HTML for me. And, uh, well, and basically, then, yeah, then... This, this technology, is, uh, sorry, this compiles a word of the HTML, I mean, DVD or schema. Right. Yeah. And it, it knows there must be this name attribute, and it uses that to, to bind it. Um, so the only thing special, uh, is down here at this input, as this at the submit button. Um, for the submit button, there is a special namespace W here uh, with a special attribute callback, and in that attribute you can specify the action that's uh, that should happen when you click the button. And in this case, the action is that you call here the function first exercise, which is down here, with the two handles as arguments. Question. Yeah, so Ah, yeah, that's a good point. That's uh, the next thing that I have to explain. Um, so the machinery that performs this submission for you see, uh, does two things. Oh, now suddenly the... Hmm. Um, it does two things. Um, it sees that here this function first exercise is typed. So here we're expecting something of type integer and we're expecting another thing of type integer. Um, from that, it demands that the two arguments here to the first exercise must be handles to input fields of integer. And it inserts the uh, correct code to um, actually check that the contents are well-formed integers before, um, before it allows this form to submit. So uh, there's a similar mechanism actually in the, in the Morse system. And what that boils down to is that you only need to write this code and you get this kind of functionality that, well, you write here this, uh, well, this is kind of the um, a snippet of the uh, web page that you generate from this program. So if you type some silly stuff in here and try to submit the, um, the, uh, uh, the page, then you automatically get this error indication, and you can uh, check that out. And so actually, this kind of feature is already present in in Wash as well. Question? Could you have used int instead of integer? Actually, yes. You could have used int as well. Mm -hmm. So how does this work for relate to what like Michael Schwartz or others have done? JWIG and mm -hmm. other, other sort of, I mean, there's been other work on right. uh, wanting to bring static, more static typing and uh, compile stuff. Time, well, time error 
including your own work on more, well, yeah, like sometimes. That's really mine, but yeah. Um, no, I was just, I'm just wondering what. Yeah, so um, uh, let's see. So just to pick one of the systems that they did, they, uh, the um, bigwig system, um, the idea there is, well, you are creating this, um, this uh, HTML form there, and um, then they can analyze which uh, input fields are uh, contained in the HTML that you create. Then they have some kind of um, um, a statement that allows you to send this, uh, uh, this to the browser and get the answer. And what they provide you then is um, a guarantee that you can only access the fields that you have specified in the in in the input field, right? Um, uh, here the model is a little bit uh, different. So the forms that you have in in BigWig only have, so to speak, one continuation, and in the one continuation you have to um, you have to determine. Uh, what has been, which uh, submit has been clicked, and uh, then you can access the, the fields uh, as, as you like. Whereas here, if you look at this, whereas here, um, this form has kind of, well, it only has one continuation, but it might have many continuations. And each of the continuation already gobbles up the input that, that it wants directly at this point. So. Uh, later on, there's no further need to check that the um, values provided are, uh, the parameters provided are the ones that are expected later on because um, they match up here by lexical binding. And that's the only way to access the parameters. So that's, I think, the major difference. And that's, that's why already a, uh, an ordinary compiler can keep track of the use of the variables. Otherwise, you need a special analysis, as they have in the in the JWIG and BigWIG system. All right. So, um, what features do we need in order to um, to uh, get what we want, more or less? So, it turns out that we need um, uh, generic classes. Um, well, which is kind of the transposition of algebraic data types, parameterized algebraic data types. And um, um, with inheritance, I only mean code inheritance. So I don't mean inheritance, which also causes subtyping. No, so it's just inheriting code. Now, um, as from the... So generic classes is kind of, you could regard that as heritage, heritage from Java, right? Um, so the next point kind of um, deletes something from Java. Namely, we will replace Java's interfaces with, well, you could say another version of interfaces, but this has caused too much uh, confusion when I gave this talk earlier. So um, uh, we decided to just call it what, it what they are, namely type classes. So we are using type classes instead of interfaces, and I will show you what kind of trade-offs that involves. Um, then we'll look at union types, and um, we'll also see that uh, you don't need a cast operation anymore in this language. Instead, we'll have a uh, something different, namely a type safe switch expression, or a safe type switch expression. And you'll see at the, at the appropriate points where which functionality is needed. All right, so um, how do type classes look in this kind of object-oriented setting? So as you will see, they look very much like interfaces, but they behave differently, and that's why they have a different name here. So this is a type class called comparable, and it's, it tells you that, well, uh, in order to be a member of that type class, you need to have a method called compare to, and it has to take a parameter that of type this, returning an int. Now, first question is, what is this? This is the type of the class that is going to implement the type class. So it's, uh, well. 
And it's obviously it's related to self-types and things like that, which have been explored by people like Kim Bruce and, and others in the object-oriented community. No? But um, all right. So the the other point um, is that implementation of uh, um, of a um, of the method of a type class can be separate from the class. So you don't need to have all the methods already in the class, but you can provide them later on as an add-on. So here is the declaration that the type integer implements comparable with some uh, implementation here. And I've been told that this implementation is not a very clever one, but never mind. Um, actually, I think it's... It, um, it can raise overflows or something like that, which it shouldn't really, because it should just compare. Anyway, so the point is that the implementation is separate from the class. And then the, the final point and most important point is that these type classes, they are not types. Yeah, so they're not types, but instead they're, they're stating just restrictions on parametric types. Yeah, so we used to um, uh, we used to call these things interfaces. But you said in the abstract, you said interfaces. I think are types, and these are not. So I mean, interfaces are types either, right? In Java, interfaces are types, and you can use them no, wherever. Many... Oh, I'm not sure. I was thinking that you know, interfaces are not types in the sense of having a you no know, semantic domain associated with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I mean, f uh, formally in in Java, you you can write an interface wherever you can write a type, right? Where you, wherever you can write a class type. Yeah, but it's, it's, yeah, well, it's perhaps just philosophical. But I mean, it's, it doesn't denote a value domain really, right? It's, it's, I mean, classes kind of denote value domains, right? In sort of like just constraints on the value domains that can. Well, anyway. Yeah, well, so so it as it turns out, um, uh, type classes are not completely identical to Java interfaces. And uh, in a couple of slides, you'll see exactly how they are related. Okay. Yeah, so there's uh, Java interfaces have an, uh, have an additional existential quantification okay. with them. And that's the, the only thing. Right. So um, let's see what that gets you if you, if you adopt this. For example, in Java 5, you can also write um, a comparable interface. And you can also write a kind of binary method like this compare to thing. But the price is a bit higher, so the comparable interface has to be made parametric or generic. And um, the argument type uh, has to mention this, um, uh, this parameter here. Yeah, so you, instead of having some um, self type around, or this type around, you have to supply an explicit type parameter here. And in order to get this type parameter to behave like a this type, you have to use this uh, reflexive uh, bound trick or recursive bound trick. May I request um, that you replace your pronunciation of one of the THISs, either the pronoun or the keyword, and I would suggest the keyword by something else. Otherwise, what you say just sounds like nonsense. I mean, if you talk about this parameter, are you talking about the this parameter or the, just this okay. parameter? Okay. So mm -hmm. Say self instead of the keyword, if you would, or choose your own replacement. Okay, I can do that. Thank you. Okay. I believe the next few slides do not use this. Yourself. Self. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah. So, but I think this this trick, the trick of having a recursive bound here, is uh, is well known. Um, but arguably, it's um, a little bit more involved to write here t extends comparable of t instead of just writing uh, t extends comparable, which is kind of what you use um, here. Also, I think the declaration that something is comparable is much uh, simpler because already in the in the uh, declaration that it that something implements here this 
here the generic interface, you already have to use the uh, recursive bound. Right. Then another point is, uh, um, which is kind of uh, required by the implements declaration anyway, that you can supply external method, methods to classes. This is not a new feature. For example, multi-Java has that as well. It allows you to add methods later on to uh, a class. Well, and I think the trade-offs here are well known, so you don't need to modify existing classes. You can reuse the code without recompiling it. Uh, you uh, have guaranteed information hiding because the external methods cannot access private variables. And the, the, the implements declaration are, um, um, can be seen really as um, um, can be seen as here the composition of an external declaration of uh, a method and just an, an implements declaration. Just, just curious, yeah. what sort of scope rules are you applying here? Because, for example, aspect J, I think, sort of global scope. I mean, everything gets added, and then there's really just one class in the end everywhere with the extra methods. Mm -hmm. But then there are things like class boxes, I believe, where you have more you know, local scoping for the extensions. Mm -hmm. So here it's just global. global. So, it, mm -hmm. so I mean, in, in the sense that whenever you know that this extension is added, then the method is also in scope. So are you using a similar underlying technique as for the open, well, as for the high class implementation? I mean, only that you don't... Yeah, you need, well, you need the same mechanism right. in order to be able to separate the implements declaration right. from, uh, from the class definition, which is mm -hmm. kind of handy. See, you somehow, I guess, you somehow associate a sort of implicit interface name or whatever with, with these guys, or I mean, you somehow infer. Yeah, I just wonder how it corresponds to the. So it's a sort of anonymous interface, right? You mean here, if you? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Ah. Well, yeah, you could oh, view it as that. Yeah, you could do it like that, but what it does is it extends um, the meaning of the class string in the scope where this uh, declaration is visible oh, it is to scope. include. Oh, it is scope? Yeah. Um, because, I mean, the, oh, I mean, type class instances in Haskell are not really scope, right? They are scoped in a strange way. Well, but I, I, I see, I see. I mean, they are, they are, they are. They're on the global scope, but still, if you don't import the type class right. at all, yes. then you can't. Then, then, that then it's line. not visible to you. Right. right. Mm, okay, I get it. Thanks. Yeah. It, it may be visible through reflection or something like that, but mm -hmm. this right. is something that we haven't considered yet. Right. Right. Another thing is, um, and another difference to interfaces is that these type classes can have static um, methods. Typical application is that you want to read and validate the input of the uh, uh, content of form entries generically. Yeah? And the typical way to do that is you'd have some type class parsable, which has a static method that parses a, a string and returns a representation of, well, whatever object, uh, whatever uh, class uh, implements here this uh, this interface, and well, a normal interface wouldn't work because well, there's no object available of the of the class type before the parsing is complete, right? So you you might call this um, uh, the, these uh, static um, uh, methods. You might call them parameterized constructors if you want to. Yeah, basically, it allows you to have constructors that depend on a type variable. Yeah, so this is just for remembering that self <laughs> is really the type of the implementing class. Yeah. All right. Yeah, and as for the implementation, there is not much new here. So you just basically add a static method to 
the uh, class that implements the, the type class. Here's the use of that, namely um, a, uh, a, a method process entry that gets a field name and then um, reads from, let's say, uh, reads from some form. It reads the string that's entered there and then parses this string to return um, some value of type t, where t is something that implements the parsable interface that extends parsable. And here is a, a typical uh, use of that. And this is a, we think this is a fairly nice feature because um, it really avoids an explicit uh, construction of a generic factory. Because so th this would be the way that you'd write um, similar code in, in Java, where you would do something like this here. You'd have an abstract class parsable interface, which is parameterized here and contains the parsing function. And then you need, um, you need a class, uh, basically, well, in Haskell terms, it would be a dictionary, which is here the class integer implements parsable, which extends here this interface. And then you would just uh, have to extend the um, parameter list for process entry by also passing such a parsable interface here. And um, then instead of just calling here parse, you would have to call the parse method of this, uh, uh, of this factory here. No? So this, already, this, this also tells you a, um, um, a way of implementing these classes, namely by adding extra um, uh, dictionary parameter, which in this case turn out to be an application of the uh, factory pattern with the generic factory. Right. Well, now we'll come to the connection to Java interfaces. And the problem that we'll look at is um, typing for collections. Now, let's say we want a type class for collections, which uh, contain values of type A. And this is just a very trivial interface, which just can generate an empty collection and which allows you to add a couple of elements to that. Now, um, genericity and um, not having uh, subtyping caused by inheritance forces that all elements of the collections have the same type, and um, meaning the same class type. And this is a very strong restriction in many cases. Um, in, in quite often, you only want that all the elements that you have in your collection that they just understand the same interface. Yeah? So if maybe they are all they can all be shown or they can all be compared or something like that. Well, compared is not a good uh, um, example in this case. But if you want to, well, transform them into a string or something like that, that would be uh, a good thing. So and. Um, of course, the answer is the kind of obvious one. You want to hide the identity of the type, and you want to just expose that the type implements some interface. So instead of asking here for a fixed type, you ask for an existential type. So there, you want the type, there exists some A that implements to string, and then this type A. And as it turns out, this corresponds, this um, existential type corresponds exactly to, a, to the Java interface like toString, which contains a toString method. Yeah? So the Java interface is actually a type class plus an existential wrapped around this with this kind of quantification. Okay, so as this uh, happens a couple of times, well, this is something that you use uh, uh, often in your programs. There are some abbreviations for that, and you can also use multiple uh, type classes and wrap them together to a new type. Yeah, but similar functionality is also available for Java, as far as I know. No, but in Java, you only have this choice, and you can't have this, um, this uh, type class mechanism, uh, which still reveals the identity of the type below. All right. Um, well, the next point in our list was union types. 
Um, what do you need those for? Well, let's consider this task. You want to define a tree structure with uh, several different types of nodes. Um, this is, uh, if you have this task in a language, in, in a Java-like language, then you look at the, at the Gang of Four book and it will tell you use the composite pattern, yeah? which means, okay, you build an abstract class and then you build your uh, node types as subclasses of this abstract class and put the usual information in that. Right, so um, in Waitomi you, have, you would have to do that using union types, which are uh, uh, not extensible. And um, the way you would do that is you would just define the two classes for leaf and branch with the same body as in Java, and then declare the type of B tree as the union type of these two class types, leaf and branch. And the line numbered one, we should ignore them right now. So now we've introduced a new typing construct. Um, as it turns out, construction of values of this type is trivial because the, the members of a union type are either are members of one of the constituent types. But now we need to be able to deconstruct these types. How do, we, how do we do that? Well. Um, it would be tempting to include something like a cast, but um, as, uh, as you all know, casts uh, introduce all kinds of problems if you want to, for example, like prove type safety. So we decided to do the scrutiny of a union type by a type switch uh, statement, which has um, different case branches for each of the participants in the union. Um, well, I mean, otherwise you would need some construct to expand the type switch, right? I mean, the type switch wants to be exhausted, so the your, your choice type is better, you know, post. But yeah, I mean, I would also I wonder, mean, I mean, if you... Yes, an Algo spec shop is a similar construct, and it doesn't have that requirement, so you, if, if you miss a case, and you get very full, you miss a case, etc. Yeah, but that's... Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. The spec sharp program verifier uh, will verify if you if there are only those two subclasses, and you can tell that for sure. It will then know that you won't ever get to the default case. Just for practical right, reasons, I think it's a close, kind of, it? kind of um, yeah, restriction to have this not extendable. Yeah, define, for example, an abstract syntax type. So using this mm -hmm. type. And it can be quite common that I want to yeah. add another node or so. Actually, I, actually, I this is stick back to the to the solution yeah. you before it's like abstract class. Actually, I, I'm, I have to confess that we are talking about a little bit of a moving target here. So uh, the first de design that we had, uh, we um, we consider it um, extensible union type, mm -hmm. where you could just add stuff later on with a different declaration then that would allow you or to declare oh by the way I'm also a member of the union mm -hmm. and now we are currently discussing um, if we should have two mechanisms namely uh, abstract classes plus um, uh, inheritance for doing this kind of extensible union uh, and just plain union types for not extensible unions so that's that's also the explanation for the one and two things in, in this. Yeah, but I believe Mill Shine, if I'm not wrong, who saw this year has a paper on a sort of you know I mean ex basically exploiting class extension with virtual methods, right? Mm -hmm. So I mean if you take a composite pattern and you can inject a virtual method off of the fact and you know you can just uh, implement the, the case of the type switch as a virtual method. Oh, that's but there, there are some approaches that try that, but I think this, I believe, oh, I'm not sure how, yeah, at least we were talking about. And so, so our first stand on that was uh, uh, you would 
well, so if you have a fixed union here, then uh, you would uh, you would have to have an exhaustive switch here. Um, for the other case, you would also have uh, a default branch here, which would capture all the other things. But it wouldn't. You would have to write this default branch ex explicitly, and you would have to raise an exception if you wanted that to happen. Yeah. Yeah, so it's, it's really quite close if you compare it to, um, to like the Haskell type system, it's really quite close to a case there. Yeah. I mean, this, the question also runs into the expression problem, right? Yeah, sure. And then, and then we know that, again, type classes can help us to solve the expression problem. Have you, have you seen my GPC paper this year? No, not yet. Okay. Oh, interesting. And in modular three, if you did not put a, uh, a default class, which is called else, uh, then then you got an else assert false essentially by oh, mm -hmm. default. So you had to give all of the cases. Oh, that's interesting. Oh. But the compiler did not check that it was exhaustive. I mean, that happened at runtime. So. Ah, I see. Ah, because the compiler wouldn't wouldn't see all of the class hierarchy at the that's point right. when it was compiling the right. type switch. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. So why? So did it have cast modular three? Yeah. Also. But, the, but if you have this, then you can define your own cast, right? Yeah, that's uh, yeah. Th this one is right. So, um, so module three both had a cast, and uh, and that is the the instance of, uh, and in addition, it had the type the type case, mm -hmm. which is just convenient. Just like um, here, you get in the case branch B, you get to name the the yes. branch B. Um, which uh, so that's module three did that as well, yeah. um, and that's I mean that's a real convenience, right? Then you don't have to like if you do this in Java, you have to write the if statement yeah. and, and then you check have to instance of and then do the cast and introduce I mean, right. just clumsier. Well, well, yeah, it's not. It, I think it's not just clumsier. It, it it also gives the compiler a better chance of of optimizing right. things, yeah, right? That's right? Because in the branch, you know perfectly well that now I have an object of this type, right? right. So for that reason, we actually prefer this kind of switch thing. Yeah. The rest, yeah, as we just discussed, can be defined, right? Right. Do you also support structural pattern matching with the cases, or is it just a type case? Um, right now, it's just type case. Yeah. Successful. I guess for full Java classes, that's difficult to have a useful matching mechanism, right? I mean, uh, Scala tries to have like two. We haven't considered that. But, but Scala also has a, what it's is it called? Yeah, it has, it separate has this case right? class, doesn't it? Uh, Which yeah, is so really something like an algebraic data yes, type. Yes, exactly. It's yeah. sort of, yeah. yeah. I mean, given all the, you know, modifiers and everything in Java, it's not totally clear how to do pattern matching, I believe. All right, and now you, we come to the points that you're probably mm -hmm. well waiting for. Now you can do, well, as you can make the visitor pattern obsolete. All right. Well, as we've al almost discussed that already, do we need to go into much detail here? I mean, it's it's uh, uh, um, already if you when you just have these um, uh, method extensions that already helps you quite a lot to um, to get the visitor pattern. So here the, the point is uh, here you have a type class with a static method count, and then uh, you basically just declare that leaf and branch both implement count, and then uh, from that definition and, uh, and the fact that this type class, well, that this signature for count here is well behaved, you can deduce that also the union type leaf um, union branch uh, that it also implements the count interface. Actually, this is uh, uh, this um, relation is not trivial. Why, yeah. why, why is that restricted to union types? I'm sorry. Did you said that's restricted to union types. Or? Well, Did you so the so the point is um, we are only declaring that leaf and branch implement the count interface, uh -huh. but later on, of course, we want to use it on the union type B tree. Yeah. yeah, but it's not trivial that uh, 
from leaf implements count and branch implements count does not always imply that also the union type implements the interface. For this interface, it's true, but it's not always true. It depends on where the self-parameter occurs here and how often it occurs and stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, just from a technical viewpoint, I mean, okay, maybe I have this uh, viewpoint. I'm not so much interested in the static type checking. I'm more interested in the expressiveness. Mm -hmm. And uh, that, that would be indeed very cool if you can write visitor patterns this way for arbitrary classes. Well, you, well, right now you're not you're not restricted to just use the components of a union type here, right? Yeah, but, but as you said, you want to apply it to the um, to the actual to the base type. No? You want to call counts and on the, on the base type. Yeah, so I don't know. Yeah, so you want you want to apply it on on on, um, on your tree type or yeah. whatever your mm -hmm. express type. And also, if if I have other defined union types that contain here branch or leaf and some other stuff, which also implements count, I also want to be able to apply to that. So without separate compilation, we do this today with partial plus and spec shop, I guess we can do, do this similarly with this separate compilation counting. I mean, with, with partial classes, you know, you just write down, we just extend the class to, to implement the map or count or whatever, mm -hmm. and then you just, but that's without separate compilation, right? Yes, I'm, I'm not sure what partial classes are. Oh, so, so C-sharp partial classes or VP partial classes basically allow you to have, you know, scattered slices of your classes extended in different files. As long mm -hmm. as they are compiled at the same time, they come together. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, have a little bit the same compilation. Okay, uh -huh. Yeah, this shouldn't be necessary here. Right. But this gives you a separate problem. Yeah, that's the intention. Yeah, that's, that's necessary for making the list of the box. So, Sing so Sharp has open classes which were developed by oh, Greg right. Jenkins, and that works with several right. mm -hmm. Okay. So, how are we on time? Should we finish on time? Because then I would jump yeah, to the conclusion slide. Yeah, probably let's uh, move a little bit faster and then we can have lots of discussion for people that want. Okay. So, well, as uh, as you may have noticed, here we have used static methods, but just the same game you can also play with uh, ordinary methods. Using extension methods. Um, well... Yeah, I think, yeah, let's maybe just talk about this slide and I won't go into detail through the code because uh, that might take a little bit longer. Another typical test point, um, which is, for example, in, the, in one of the Scala papers, is that you would like to have a typed version of the subject observer patterns. And the problem here is that you have a mutual dependency of between subject and observer. Yeah, so in the subject, you have this kind of registration method that takes an observer argument. And in the observer, you have this notify, no, update method that takes the subject as an argument. And interestingly, um, uh, the, a standard extension of the type class mechanism uh, lives up to this problem as well. So in Haskell, you have multi-parameter type classes and here you could extend or transfer that into um, multi-headed type classes if you want to. Yeah, by well, multi-parameter type classes express some express some relation between types, stating requirements of, on each of them, and actually you can transpose that more or less into this um, setting. And the example code is uh, well inspired by the Scala paper, and it makes use of a slightly um, um, a debatable feature, namely that you have default code in there. And because then there's the problem of where you would actually you, where you actually want to put the code for this this default code and uh, so that's not completely uh, nice. 
So basically, what you have here is uh, now um, instead of having a an implicit type parameter called this, uh, you can name the type parameter for the two, for the implementing classes by just putting them explicitly here. In this case, there are two classes involved, and we can call them subject and observer. And then in, inside, we have uh, uh, we state the requirements on each class just by naming the class again and then putting the methods in these bodies here. Yeah? So the observer has to have some update method that takes a subject, and the subject needs to have a notify method that, oh well, here it has the register method that takes an observer, and it also has this notify method that does something to it. So as I said, so um, there are some features in here that might not live for very long, namely here, that you can define variables here in, in a class. I don't think that this is a very good feature, and this is probably to be uh, deleted in the future. Yeah, but nevertheless, so the method is, is kind of that uh, multi-parameter type classes or multi-headed type classes can uh, do allow you to express also the subject observer pattern. Did you say that there was a difference between that and Scala, or that's just what Scala does as well, right? Um, uh, Scala uses an entirely different mechanism, doesn't it? So they have these um, uh, abstract, what are they called? Abstract class parameters. Well, you, could have, you could have the, well, I mean, two parameters like subject, subject observer, I can't remember what they call it. I would have to look at the, at the paper again. Well, actually, so the point that I want to make is that the same type class-like mechanism can be applied to this problem just as well. And right. it, it just you seamlessly is traits, and a trait has inner abstract classes, right? How we'd have to, I don't think they, they need traits for that. I don't think they need traits for this example now. Oh, because otherwise, uh, so, so the, this place down here would indicate a uh, parameterized class. Right. Well, and the only annotations that we've seen is just syntactic sugar. Namely, well, instead of writing the comparable interface that you've seen on one of the first slides, you could also be able to name your implementing class by yourself and then include that uh, method signature in this year. It's just more verbose. All right, I think we're, I think we'll skip over that. Yeah, so this is the, this is the problem that I mentioned before. So if uh, A implements an interface and B implements an interface, then doesn't always hold that also the union type of A and B implements the interface. And um, uh, actually, um, this, uh, uh, this implication between here and here um, may not hold in either direction, depending on what, uh, uh, how you use the self-parameter in your interfaces. And for that reason, we also allow you uh, to write explicit implements declarations for a union type if that can't be derived from the implementations of the, um, of the uh, constituents of the union here. Well. But are they useful? Because it feels unclear to me. I mean, if you, you, know, if you have covered the cases, mm -hmm. Um, yeah, yeah. Are there only so far only you know strange examples, or do you have something? Um, nice? This is a strange example. Let me think. Um, well, 
we can, we can yeah. Probably, Maybe we should do that offline and yeah, just, just go through this conclusion side, which slide, which more or less states the uh, status of the project. So um, what we've done so far is, is this here. There's an untapped implementation of the, of the server part, which means there's uh, uh, an implementation of the language that ignores, er well, that ignores clients more or less completely and just compiles to servlets. Then there is a, a compiler that compiles um, the typed, a typed version of Ytomo to Java, but it's not the current version, not, not the one that I'm talking about, but it's an older version of, uh, of the language. And because the target language was Java, um, the students who worked on this had to make further restrictions. So he wanted to integrate that with Java, and he wanted to be able to uh, import Java type hierarchies and, and inheritance, and for that he had to make a number of compromise, compromises. Well, then we have, a, we have a type soundness proof of that, and as I was saying, one of my students uh, is just finishing his um, uh, thesis on this uh, splitting transformation and uh, analysis of splitting things into client and server parts. So what we're currently doing is, actually we're also revising parts of the language. Uh, we are, once we've done that, then we're implementing a compiler for the current version. Uh, I'm trying to persuade a student to do an implementation of the, of the client part as well. And uh, one thing I already mentioned is that we would like to also extend the type system to cover regular expression types, which look kind of the natural generalization of union types, <coughs> and then to integrate everything and get a working system. Right, that's it. Thank you for your patience.